Welcome to On the Issues. I'm Councilman Jim Waring, and I'm honored to be hosting U.S. Senator John McCain on today's show. Senator, thanks so much for coming. You've been on well, before, and we really appreciate it very much. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, we are living in interesting times, so I'm sure we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> I would say uh, there is no shortage of things to talk about, and to say these are interesting times is probably underselling. So we'll get right to it. Uh, your thoughts on one of the craziest years I've seen, mm -hmm. but, uh, but I know you have said similar things, and so I'm curious your take on and how 2016 is ending up? Well, I think uh, obviously the pollsters were all wrong and uh, the Clinton campaign was certainly all wrong. Um, I think there was a gross underestimation of the anger and frustration that many people feel, particularly in rural America, particularly among white, older, blue collar workers who've lost their jobs and have seen no prospect of a newer job. Now, a lot of people blame that on, tra on trade. Uh, I think that that may be partially to blame, but I think the biggest aspect of it is, is the automation that's taken place and the technology leaps we've made. Uh, for example, 10 years ago, if you went to an automobile factory in Michigan, where Trump carried, you would see workers all over cars as they went down the assembly line. If you went today, you would see a few people watching robots put <clears throat> those cars together. I think another factor that we underestimated, all of us, and that is the uh, uh, two other aspects. One, we really have never recovered from 2008. There's been a little improvement, but there's never been a real uh, recovery that we could, you know, with, like there has been from other uh, economic meltdowns, and it certainly was a meltdown in 2008. And I, and I think the other aspect of it is that um, the campaign's pollsters kind of relied on an older model rather than a newer model. And that newer model doesn't, well, what I mean is, so many millennials now don't have a television set and they get all their information off the internet. So when the pollster calls and they see it's a number they don't know, click, they're not gonna answer a pollster. So it makes the pollster's job extremely, extremely difficult. So all those factors uh, contributed to arguably the greatest upset in political history since Truman beat Dewey back in 1948. Yeah, I can't remember anything even remotely close to it since then. Um maybe at a local race or something, but usually they were fairly accurate. Uh, and that was certainly not the case this time for the reasons must, you suggest. And I must tell you that uh, I saw a lot of this turbulence out there and that's why I took this campaign so seriously and worked so hard, both in the primary and the general election. I really started working hard three years ago, uh, not two years ago or one year ago, but three years ago because I could see, if you go into the southern part of our state, particularly the, where the real estate collapse was so harmful, you will see um, that there really hasn't been a, a significant recovery and there's a lot of very unhappy citizen, citizens. And so, uh, interesting times. Well, you certainly got sent back with a mandate, obviously to win by the margin you won by is, is a pretty impressive feat in the climate that you're describing, which was not incumbent friendly by any stretch of the imagination. I think the advantage that I had was that most of the people in Arizona know me by now. And so they were not so much affected by the Trump phenomena or Clinton, although the Clinton campaign did come into this state very strongly. Very heavily, you know, yeah, they did. Very heavily, both media and hiring people on the ground. Maybe in retrospect, and I certainly wouldn't criticize them, but maybe they should have spent a little more of that time in Michigan and Pennsylvania and the other Midwestern States would bear that, that, out. He, <laughs> that yeah, he lost. Really decisively. Yeah. But so, so one, of the, one of the things that I think probably voters probably responded to was your chairmanship of the Armed Services Committee. Obviously there was talk, Republicans will lose the Senate and so forth, but they didn't, so you're still chairman. Do you want to talk a little bit about how that impacts Arizona? It impacts Arizona very strongly. Uh, we have Raytheon down in Tucson who have committed to hiring another two or 3,000 workers thanks to a road realignment that we made, giving them an area to expand 
to up here where the Apache helicopter is still the most, the, every nation on earth wants Apache helicopters. Excuse me. And then you've got all the smaller contractors. Then you have our military bases, Davis Month and uh, MCAS Yuma, Luke, um, the, even Camp Navajo up in Flagstaff. And those are, are very big aspects of the military industrial complex. But there are also a lot of smaller companies uh, and corporations that do business here in Arizona as well. The impact of the military and defense on the economy of our state has been really significant. I've heard estimates as much as 15 to 20 percent of our economy if you totaled everything together. Then what's not in there is the retirees. As you know, so many people who serve here want to come back here to in their retirement years. So it is really important uh, part of our economy. And finally, the Goldwater Ranges. The only place left in America where you can still train using live ordnance, real weapons, is the Goldwater Ranges. And so that also makes our military bases more important rather than having planes come from Idaho or uh, other places to, uh, to do their training. The other, by the way, other training ground is uh, at, up in Nevada at Nellis. But as far as live ordinance is concerned, it's, uh, it's, it's a Goldwater Ranges. So defense is, is very important. And finally, one other subset of that is the A-10. The Air Force wanted to retire the A-10 because the Air Force, and I love them, okay, but they're always interested in the latest fighter aircraft, and they always seem to not disregard, but not have as a high priority their close air support mission. They wanted to replace the A-10, which costs around $15 million, with the F-35, which costs about $150 million, and the B-1 bomber, which are neither, none of which are close air support. And I gotta give a lot of credit to Congresswoman Martha McSally down in Tucson, who is a former A-10 squadron commander herself. And so we blocked it for two or three years. Guess what airplane is now doing the bulk of the close air support work in Iraq and Syria? The A-10. So that was uh, one of the elements, I think, that um, uh, uh, had an effect. Um, and we are in more danger. This country is in facing more threats and attacks than any time since the end of World War II. And I think that some of my work on those issues has also been helpful to the country and to Arizona. Well, specifically for the city, one sort of subset of the, the threats you talk about, cybersecurity, you know, we obviously, you know, I don't think we've had a, a big issue so far, but certainly it's not for lack of trying. You know, that's something that's kind of moving to the forefront, I think. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? About a year ago, the chairman, then chairman of this Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, was asked um, in potential uh, conflicts of the future, how do we stack up against our possible adversaries? And he said, we have a significant advantage in every aspect of possible confrontation, except one, cyber. And there are scenarios that reach as far as a Russian, who are the best at it, Chinese are second best at it, shut down satellites. Can you imagine what would happen to our lives if the satellites were shut down? There's no doubt they hacked into this campaign. If they can hack into a political campaign and change the outcome, and by the way, I'm not saying that they affected the outcome or even that they intended to change the out outcome. We've got to have hearings on that. But suppose they could. Then you destroy the fundamental of a democracy. You, you corrupt an election. That's the fundamental of, of democracies is free and fair elections. So. Uh, we're going to have hearings on this, but we're going to have hearings in the committee on all of cyber, and uh, we will be looking at uh, what we can do and what we should do. The problem with the B Obama administration is they have no policy. So if you have no policy, then you can't develop a strategy. In other words, we have no policy as to what to do about seeing a strike coming 
boy don't know what to do in response to it. There's no policy. And so they, we've just kind of sat back and let these attacks play, take place at no cost. Listen, m my campaign in 2008 was hacked into, I mean, as far back uh, as that. And the sophistication level of these cyber attacks are very important. The, the head of Cyber Command, and we could spend our whole time on this, but the head of Cyber Command testified before our committee. He said, the problem is, I don't know what I don't know. Now, when you think about the implications of that statement, that the head of our Cyber Command doesn't know what he doesn't know, in other words, he doesn't know what the attacks are and what's coming, et cetera, then that means that it has to be one of the highest priorities for the nation. And I believe that President Trump understand, President-elect Trump understands that, but I also know that General Mattis, our incoming Secretary of Defense, certainly knows about it. Well, obviously you've been instrumental um, in your comments. I, I saw you when I was at the gym this morning pedaling away on the extra cycle. You were, you were speaking about uh, the cabinet officers. I mean, you've had obviously very strong views about Russia. Do you want to talk about sort of that coming together and, and your thoughts? Well, uh, I believe that Vladimir Putin is a thug and a bully and a murderer, and I have, there's ample evidence to back it up. He's an old KGB agent that wants to restore the Russian Empire. That's why he's putting so much pressure on the Baltic countries, Moldova. He invaded Ukraine. It was Russian equipment that shot down a Malaysian airliner. The list could go on and on and on. He poisoned uh, uh, one of uh, the uh, KGB people that was uh, in London, the list goes on and on. Um, and so... And he's a big fan of yours. <laughs> oh, yeah, he, he sanctioned me. Yes, he did. Uh, at the same time that he was giving an award to Mr. Tillerson for bring, being a friend of, of the, Russia. So um, I believe that we have to understand Vladimir Putin for what he is. I think we have to remember that there was another president that came to office named Ronald Reagan who articulated peace through strength, that said, take down this wall about the Berlin Wall, and won the Cold War, in the words of Margaret Thatcher, without firing a shot. I'm not interested in a war with Russia. I am interested in following the path that Ronald Reagan did, building up our defense capabilities, strengthening our alliances. But, by the way, our, our Baltic friends and other European nations, they're, the best I can describe them is a state of uncertainty. In some cases, it's real concern to the, to the point that it's almost fear. So we need to build up our defenses. We need, we're still the best military on Earth. We're still the best commanded. We are still, we are now net uh, energy exporters. We still have the technology and capability. So we need a president who will lead and use it. And Vladimir Putin is a bully. He's a bully, that's all he is. And bullies back down in the face of steadfast, uh, strong capabilities. In other words, there's so many things we could be doing. One is inst installing the anti-missile capabilities in Eastern Europe. The other thing is strengthening our ties with the Eastern European countries, including the Baltics, which we are doing some of, but we gotta do a lot more. We have to give defensive weapons. You know, President Obama refused to give defensive weapons to the Ukrainians. I'm talking about defensive weapons in the face of an invasion by Russia into their country. Uh, so there's a whole lot of steps that we could take to show our strength and show uh, Vladimir Putin that he's not going to succeed. And, that is not, and the best way to avoid wars is to be prepared for them. And that's the lesson of history over and over again. And again, you are center of it, you're at the center of it uh, as chairman of the Armed Services Committee, but you want to talk a little bit about your Tillerson, relationship with... By the way, oh, Mr. Sure. Tillerson, Mr. Tillerson, as the head of ExxonMobil, one of the world's largest corporations, um, did business with Vladimir Putin. I don't begrudge him that, but I also remember the words of Lenin who said, uh, the capitalists will hang themselves and we'll sell them the rope to do it. So I want to know what his attitude and what his position as Secretary of State will be vis-a-vis vis -vis Vladimir Putin and Russia. I am not saying I will not vote for Mr. Tillerson. I'm saying that I want to examine the, his record and what he will do. And that's the role of the United States Senate, advise and consent. And 
that's in the Constitution of the United States. Um, the president-elect Trump, I think, has the benefit of the doubt. He was just elected by the American people. But that does not mean, as it is not meant with the Obama administration or Bush administration or Clinton administration, all of which I've had a role in advising consent. Speaking of that, the new Secretary of Defense, you'll obviously be working with him very intimately. Yeah. I've known him very well for a long time. He's a great leader. He was fired as the head of Central Command, which is one of our major commands that has to do with the Middle East, because he wasn't going along with the 30-somethings in the White House that are on the National Security Council. There's a famous story that uh, former Secretary of Defense Gates likes to tell, that he was in Kabul, Afghanistan. He walked by an office of one of the generals, and there was a red phone. And he said, he said, what is that phone? And he said, that's our direct line to the White House, to the NSC staff. And Secretary Gates said, rip that out, rip that out. They were micromanaging from the National Security Council staff, who, by the way, has no charter to do so, but that were giving orders on rules of engagement to our commanders in the field. And that's why we are not winning in Afghanistan. The major influence in Iraq today is not the United States, it's the Iranians. And we are having enormous difficulties in sorting out who our friends are and who, what their ambitions are. And the, there's no doubt that Russia's major effort is not ISIS. Russia's major effort is keeping Bashar Assad in power. That's the Iranians' major effort. The ISIS just retook Palmyra while the Russians are bombing the people that we trained and armed and equipped in Aleppo. That, that is clear evidence of what Vladimir Putin's priorities are. You've been outspoken about Syria as well, another trouble spot in the world, and you just obviously touched on it. Do you want to expand a little bit about where you see, see things going? I'm going to have a lot of sorrow this Christmas uh, because so many thousands have been murdered and wounded and displaced over the last uh, few weeks as Russia, Iranians, Hezbollah, Syrians have orchestrated a brutal campaign, uh, bombing, precision bombing of hospitals, uh, uh, war crimes, atrocities that are hard to do describe, and they are driving the uh, opposition out of Aleppo. Aleppo is the really major ancient city in Syria. There's great symbolism associated with it. Um, the picture that appeared on the front page of every newspaper in America a month or so ago of a little boy uh, sitting in a chair covered with dirt and blood encapsulates the that what has happened in Syria, the senseless slaughter of so many innocents. This will go down along with Rwanda and Srebrenica as one of the great atrocities of recent times. And the fault, it will be on the record of Barack Obama. And I won't waste the rest of our time talking about how it happened, but there was a time when Bashar Assad was about to fall we did nothing. So switching gears to, to our local economy or the economy, uh, United States economy. Yeah, let me just say oh, the sure. two challenges, I believe, of the 21st century in Arizona are fire and water. We've been working hard on trying to get forest clearing, uh, the support these uh, commercial enterprises that harvest uh, we need to focus our attention on water. It's going to be a crisis. It's nearing a point in Lake Mead, as you know, where certain things are triggered. What's our relationship with China, with uh, California? Uh, who's going to give up water first? And if you give up water, who's going to be affected by it? Uh, I'm, I think our governor and our head of Department of Water Resources are working hard but this is going to require work be, that goes between our federal officials, the Secretary of the Interior, who, the next Secretary of the Interior is going to be very important to this issue of, of water, forest thinning, of all of these issues are really vital to the future of Arizona. One of them is to 
is to clear this bush that's, that we all know about that, that is drinking so much water that we're working hard on as well. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done uh, in that area, and I hope that all of us can work very closely together on it. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a gonna be a real challenge. Uh, our challenge now is to make sure our children and grandchildren, by the way, I just had one, uh, grandchild, uh, is to see that they have the same opportunities in life in Arizona that we had. That it is, is at risk here, but there are ways to do it. It's not that we can't do it. It's that we got it working together. We must, and I believe we will. I believe we've got a great governor. I believe we've got mayors and city councils that are committed to it. And I believe that we have people like the Salt River Project and uh, the Central Arizona Project that are, that are in 100%. Well, I know the city of Phoenix is taking your words to heart. We're investing tens of millions of dollars in trying to ensure, you know, water safety, I guess I would say, going forward, you know, I'm sustainable proud. community. You I'm know, very proud of the city of Phoenix. Lot. Could I just mention sure, another thing about the city of Phoenix? I tell everybody I talk to when we talk about veterans that the city of Phoenix, that there's not a homeless person, veteran in the city of Phoenix. And again, I am so proud to be a resident of a city that takes care of our veterans. And I wanna thank the mayor, the city council, who have made this happen. And it's a model for every city uh, in America. The so courts have come up with innovative you. programs. You know, our staffers have really worked hard on that. So I will pass that along and they will really appreciate it. But, but it was a lot of effort and I think well-placed, as you suggest. Uh, speaking of the city of Phoenix, there was something in the paper here recently about the FAA. Yeah. A lot of our citizens watching this show, uh, certainly in my area, particularly my friends, had issues. After a lot of work yeah. and a lot of effort, we got to on the, there's one virtue of being chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee. On occasion, you're able to get the agreement of the other members to get a provision in that's not exactly totally in line with, although this has to do with Luke Air Force Base and overflights and interaction between commercial airliners and Luke Air Force Base. So there is a legitimate concern about that, but uh, everybody wants a new study, and we're going to get a new study. And it's in the president hasn't signed the bill, but I'm confident that he will because it passed through the Senate with a vote of 92 to 7. And by the way, when we hear about all this partisanship on the Armed Services Committee, we work together. We work Republicans and Democrats together, and that's why we get a vote like 92 to 7 on our product. And I'm very proud of that relationship that Republicans and Democrats have. And I have with the senior Democrat on the committee, Jack Reed of Rhode Island, who by the way happens to be a graduate of West Point, and he's the happiest member of the United States Senate <laughs> since Army finally did, defeated did you go to Navy. The game? I went to the game. Oh, I did. I'm sorry. But you know, we got. I was going to be too polite to bring it up. Once every 15 years, we got to let him. <laughs> we got to let him. That was uh, the longest winning streak yeah, in the series, right? Yeah, 14 ever, games ever. Right? And uh, you know, it does affect these kids' morale. Mm -hmm. And I do believe in balance, yeah. just not very often. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a great. Uh, uh, it's a great event, and all the things leading up to it and uh, uh, the, it's, it's remarkable. And by the way, I'm glad the president-elect attended the game. Yeah. Well, we, uh, back to the FAA for just yeah. one second. Um, we really owe you a, a debt of thanks because I talked to you several times, uh, interacted on the your staff. <laughs> My dear viewers, he talked to me incessantly. It wasn't that much. Viewers, we didn't run each other into each other on any occasion <laughs> that it wasn't brought to my attention. So yeah. you can well, we, thank uh, him for being a real pain <laughs> you know where. Well, we appreciate uh, you and I uh, so interacted with Senator Flake's staff. I mean, the two of you really worked on this. It's a, it's a big deal. I'm sure if you yeah, probably realize it's a big a deal job. to get something inserted like that and uh, to get it to the president's desk. Obviously, we didn't know how the elections would turn out or how this would go, but it is promising that, that they will have to review these lines because if you look at the maps, they're not following what they said was something that they had to have. And so I'm hopeful they might reevaluate and, uh, and really save a lot of our citizens you know, an aggravation. It's not as big as some of maybe the issues we let off with in the international and national stage, but it's important. And uh, the city of Phoenix really owes you a debt of thanks because there were thousands of people really, really upset about this and rightfully so. It was not well handled by the FAA. I was very grateful to be 
reelected by the people of Arizona and the voters, and I'm very grateful. And it was great fun to campaign all over the state. You went all over. It was really amazing to watch. By the way, I one one play. I recommend many places, but <laughs> the one week, one Saturday night a month, they have a shootout down in uh, Tombstone. Mm -hmm. I, I recommend <laughs> that that one, uh, and I'm very grateful. But I'm also very proud of my state, and I'm also very proud of the city of Phoenix. You work in a bipartisan fashion as well, and I've had very good relations with Mayor Stanton and with all of the, the city council, and that's very helpful when issues come up. And I want to thank also the mayor, the city council, and the citizens of Phoenix for the incredibly strong support that they give our folks out at Luke Air Force Base. It's, uh, I run into uh, men and women all the time who served there that said, I loved being there and I loved being in the valley. And so I think we can be proud like of that. Like you said, so many of them come back. I mean, they that, come that's the ultimate here. referendum on what they actually thought of their experience. That's exactly so. right. And uh, some of our leaders have come from those who have left the military and continue to serve. And uh, I'm, I'm very proud. Yeah. Well, we tried to, you know, you and I are on the, the Republican team, but certainly I think in our interactions, I think I'd like to thank both of us, include myself in that. We try not to make the, the comments personal and so forth. And so, uh, you know, as a city, for issues that, that really benefit all the citizens in a nonpartisan fashion, like the FAA one, really appreciated your willingness to, to hear out my Democrat colleagues as well. I know you met with a couple of them, uh, uh, Gallego and Pastor in DC. I know they really appreciated that. And, uh, you know, I'm afraid we're gonna have to close on that note because we're out of time, but but you're really a big help with that issue. Thank you, and uh, we've got a lot of challenges ahead, uh, but I look forward to continuing in the coming years working with you, the mayor, and all members of the city council, and it's been a privilege for me to, be in it, to have been able to do so in the past. Well, thanks so much, Senator. I really appreciate you being on the show yet again. I think it's the fourth or fifth time. It means a lot to us and our viewers, and I appreciate it very much. And that's it for On the Issues. You know, if you have any questions or comments, please call my office at 602-262-7445 or visit my website at phoenix.gov slash district2. And we look forward to seeing you next time on the issues. <laughs> <laughs>